Jason Anthony Jolkowski was your average teen. Born June 24, 1981, in Grand Island, Nebraska, Jason was your typical, if a little bit quiet, child. His mother described him as shy and noted that Jason only had a small handful of friends. By the summer of 2001, Jason, then 19, was living with his parents and was a student at Iowa Western Community College, taking classes in the radio broadcasting program. Jason's dream was to become a radio DJ for 89.7 KIWR, the local alternative station that was licensed to broadcast out of the college. And, as with any other teenager his age, Jason also had a part-time job that he worked at a place called Fazoli's, a regional Italian chain restaurant that was located only a few miles from his home. On Wednesday, June 13th of 2001, Jason was at home and was called into work early by his boss. At the time, the car that Jason used was in for repairs, and so he decided to simply walk to work, a roughly four-mile trip. But knowing this would be a long walk, Jason managed to secure plans with another co-worker and catch a ride and to work with them. But it seems that Jason was not one for giving proper directions. This was 2001, and well before the age of smartphones and the first portable commercial GPS-enabled phone had only been released months prior. So... It's not that unusual for a teenager to have trouble giving directions to someone to their own home if they weren't sure where they were coming from. To remedy this, Jason told his co-worker to meet him at Benson High School as both of them had attended the school and both knew how to easily get there. The school itself was only a short seven blocks away from Jason's home. At around 10.45 a.m., a neighbor saw Jason helping his younger brother pulling up the trash cans from the curb just prior to him leaving to go meet his ride at the high school. This would be the last time that anyone saw Jason ever again. Less than an hour later, his co-worker called Jason's home and let his family know that Jason never arrived at the high school and that he had been forced to leave in order to not be late for work himself. An investigation was eventually launched, but no trace of Jason was found. The security cameras from the high school were combed over, but Jason didn't turn up on any of the footage. It seems in the few blocks between his home and the high school, a route Jason had no doubt taken for years and knew quite well, he simply vanished without a trace. And in the 22 years since his disappearance, there have been no leads, no evidence uncovered, and no suspects in the case. Jason also had nearly $700 in his bank account at the time of his disappearance, none of which has been touched, and no outstanding paychecks have ever been cashed. His car was also never picked up, and there has been no activity on his cell phone since before he vanished. Jason's parents have never stopped looking for their son, and in 2005, they helped to pass Jason's law in Nebraska. Jason's law created a statewide database for missing persons in order to aid police and investigators. As of this year, 2023, the Omaha Police Department is still investigating the disappearance of Jason Jolkowski.
born March 25th of 1981. Michael had his whole life ahead of him, and by the time he had turned 18, it seemed like he was well on his way to achieving his dreams. 1999 saw Michael get into UCLA on a music scholarship, and by all accounts, life for the young musician was going well. Michael lived on campus in Dykstra Hall, and by all accounts was your typical student. He had no enemies, wasn't suffering from depression, wasn't addicted or experimenting with drugs or alcohol that we know of, and outside of his passions for music, he liked to play online games in his spare time. So, on the 10th of December, 1999, Michael attended a party on the floor that he lived on in the dorm as a way to get to know everyone better and get some much-needed downtime. By all accounts from those there, everything was normal, and sometime during the party, Michael called it a night and returned to his room on the same floor. From there, he signed in and began to play an online video game with a friend that lived in another dorm room. It seems the pair played until roughly 4 a.m., and after the game ended, Michael left his room to visit his friend and congratulate him on a good night of gaming. The pair talked for a little bit before Michael said his goodbyes and began walking back to his room. This would be the last time that anyone saw Michael Negrete again. Around 9 a.m., Michael's roommate in the dorm woke up and noticed that Michael wasn't home. This might not be the strangest thing in a college dorm, but he noticed that Michael's shoes, his wallet, keys, and most notably his trumpet were all still there in the dorm. For those that don't know, UCLA is a massive campus right in the middle of the city of Los Angeles and a very busy place. It would seem odd that Michael would not be noticed, but also because of the amount of people and how the campus is laid out and surrounded by businesses, a single person disappearing would not be unheard of. The only lead that police got in the disappearance that held any weight was one that a student gave of a Caucasian male who they didn't recognize as living in the dorm who was seen on the floor Michael lived on the night of his disappearance. Police released a sketch of that individual and requested that they come forward to speak with police, but no one ever came forward. Later, police dogs were used to track Michael's scent, which they managed to link to a nearby bus stop. But police said that the dogs had gotten confused during the search and that their findings could not be trusted. Over the years, Michael's parents have hired a number of detectives and even offered a $100,000 reward for information leading to the whereabouts of their son. But investigators found nothing, and the reward has yet to be claimed. Sometime in 2013, Michael's brother Steve stated that just before he vanished, Michael had just recently begun experimenting with drugs, ecstasy in particular, and attended various raves in the area just before he disappeared. He believes that Michael potentially left his building early that morning under the influence of something and was abducted in the process.
The case of Matthew Pendergrast is one of the more unusual that we have touched on so far. Matthew was a student at Rhodes College in Memphis, Tennessee in the year 2000, and he was only two weeks away from graduation when he disappeared. On the morning of December 1st of 2000, Matthew had a scheduled Spanish class at college which was only four blocks away from where he lived at the time. Early that morning, around 8 a.m., Matthew was seen leaving his residence in his 1998 Toyota 4Runner, seemingly on his way to class. Sometime that morning, Matthew had also called a friend who lived in the Atlanta area, but it is unclear what the pair spoke about, but we do know that this was the last time that anyone heard from Matthew because he never arrived to class. What's strange is that later that same day, around 2 p.m., Matthew's truck was discovered abandoned alongside a private dirt road in Lone Oak County, Arkansas, just off Interstate 40 about 120 miles from his home. The area in which the truck was found is known as the Bayou Meadow and is a swamp that is often used by local hunters in the area. Police found that Matthew's truck was unlocked at the time and that the keys were still in the ignition. Nearby, police discovered Matthew's clothing a pair of blue jeans, a t-shirt, his shoes and socks, all neatly folded. Inside the pocket of his jeans was Matthew's wallet, still containing all his credit cards, his driver's license, and $46 in cash. A search of the surrounding area, though, showed no evidence of Matthew. But upon searching the truck, police did find something interesting, that being Matthew's journal. Inside, Matthew had written about what is known as the Silver Elves, a group of people who describe themselves as, quote, a family of elves who have been living and sharing the elven way since 1975. The group has a website that is still up and running which talks about their spiritual path to self-discovery and immortality. Other writings found inside Matthew's journal talk about his philosophical thoughts on life and death and a desire to attain immortality. Most notable of all was a passage Matthew wrote in which he talks about walking into water and becoming one with nature itself. Now, it's possible that Matthew had become sucked into this elven world and wished to attain some sort of immortality by walking naked into that swamp. But why that swamp in particular? And why at that point in his life? As previously stated, Matthew was only two weeks from graduation and many have noted that there were other bodies of water much closer that Matthew could have used. Matthew's friends and family have gone on record to say that Matthew was happy and that he was not the type of person who would take his own life. That by no means indicates that Matthew wasn't having personal issues, but all those around him seemed to think that Matthew was doing just fine. It should be noted that no evidence of any sort of illegal activity regarding Matthew has ever been found. For her part, Matthew's mother, as well as one of the investigators on the case, believed that the scene where Matthew's truck had been found had been staged. Matthew's mother noted that he was not a very neat person and that his room, even at the time of his disappearance, had been in disarray, something typical for Matthew. Authorities have classified Matthew's disappearance as suspicious, but as of now, 
some 22 years later, no new evidence has arisen and Matthew remains missing. If you've made it this far, we'd like to thank you for watching and hope you stick around for more mysteries in the future. If you have any thoughts, theories, or ideas about what could have befallen any of the individuals in this video, feel free to post them in the comments below. Maybe, just maybe, someone out there can help solve one of these cases and bring the closure that the families so desperately want and deserve. Until next time, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe so you don't miss out on any future uploads. And remember to stay safe out there, and we'll see you again in another video.